Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the first thing I should do is apologize profuse, profusely to you all. If it's any comfort to you, my alarm <coughs> went off approximately nine hours ago. So uh, you aren't the only ones who've suffered today. Um, I managed to take a, a motorbike taxi from the Gare du Nord uh, to get here. It still took a very long time, and I had several very interesting near-death experiences, which will become the topic for future lectures, I'm sure. Um, I'm very grateful to Professor de Ain and to, for the, to the Collège de France for inviting me to speak here. Um, I'm very aware of the tremendously proud history of uh, developing and disseminating learning that uh, the college has, has um, been part of. And to participate in that, even to a small extent, is a great honor. So thank you very much. Um, today I'm going to talk about psychosis. I'm going to... Okay. I'm going to begin by describing what I mean by psychosis in very broad descriptive terms. I'm going to pay particular attention to delusions and hallucinations, or the strange beliefs and experiences that people with psychosis describe. Um, I'm going to then move on to... Sorry. I'll just wait until this is completed. Okay. Merci. I'm going to then move on to um, considering delusions in more detail, and to consider... Uh, delusions and perception, inference and belief, theories of delusions that we've had in the past and a novel uh, theory that I'd like to put before you in the spirit of the college of trying to, to um, bring out new ideas that are speculative but testable. And finally, I'm going to present some data that um, relates to uh, studies that we've done and that we have coming out that test these theories. So, Briefly, the talk is divided into three broad parts, uh, roughly distinguished according to these different levels. So to begin with, what do I mean by psychosis? It's a descriptive term, first and foremost, and it refers largely to being dissociated from or separate from reality. And it's characterised by delusions, which are formally defined as irrational beliefs held without good evidence, um, uh, that are out of keeping with somebody's sociocultural norms and are held with great tenacity, even in the face of seemingly <coughs> contradictory evidence. Hallucinations, on the other hand, refer to perceptions, a perception without a stimulus. As I'm going to, I hope, um, make clear to you, I think the distinction between these two is much less clear than that. And perception and belief are actually more closely related than theorists have of this sort of psychopathology have, um, have really acknowledged, explicitly at least. One thing I would point out is that psychosis is a feature of severe mental illness. It's a characteristic of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and other mental illnesses such as psychotic depression. Um, and it also is a feature of certain physical and neurological illnesses. So it's, it's an important uh, concept to, to study and to try to understand. I'm going to begin by giving you some examples of this sort of psychopathology. So this is a, an example of a delusion. A man with schizophrenia described having this experience. And this has been referred to as a delusion of reference, wherein somebody believes that the media or the newspapers or something around them is referring directly to them in a very concrete, explicit way. All the time, they're talking about me on the television. They're talking about me and they're talking to me, send me sending me messages. They think I'm some sort of political leader. That's a classic delusion, a classic feature of schizophrenia. This is something I documented from a young woman whom I saw only last week at her home. She was sitting in her um, sitting room with the curtains completely closed. She'd refused to go out for about six months. Her mother was extremely worried about her. It became clear just what frightening, frightening experiences she was having. Um, if I have a fight with my sister and I run to my room, then I can still hear her whispering about me, calling me names. And when I asked her about this, it was clear that she could hear her sister whispering to her, even though her sister might have left the house. She heard this as a very definite voice in her ear. This is a classic auditory hallucination. And hallucinations may occur in all of the sensory modalities. Another classic feature of um, schizophrenia and other psychotic illnesses is uh, delusions of control, or what's been referred to as passivity, being passive. 
This again is a, a man with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. They use the machine to make me move, they make me walk, they make me stagger. Uh, they control most of my movements, movements like walking and running, making me smile when I don't want to. This is a very interesting phenomenon to me because I think it crosses the boundary between a belief and an experience or a sensory experience. And most people with delusions of control find it difficult to decide whether they're feeling something, experiencing a sensation, or whether it's part of the belief. And I think this is one instance in which it's important to remind ourselves that delusions are very like hallucinations in many ways. And that's uh, something I'd like to, to, to bring out, to talk about today. So the starting point is how can we begin to understand phenomena like this with respect to low-level brain processes? What constitutes an explanation? Well, nowadays we do have some very sophisticated brain imaging technology which we can apply to individuals who suffer from uh, these symptoms. So somebody who maybe feels that the television is talking to them could have their brain scan and we could look at brain activity, for example, in this area here which is called the ventral striatum. And that may show overactivity or underactivity. There may be some abnormality of response in that region. So perhaps it's this that accounts for this. Alternatively, we can make neurochemical measurements. I don't want to dwell on this. This is work from La Ruelle's group uh, in New York at the time, showing a hyper-excitability of dopamine system in people with schizophrenia. I, I'm just flashing up this graph to show that there are many examples of brain abnormalities in people with psychosis. But there's a problem there, and that's the starting point for my, my work, really. The problem is we don't really know whether this causes the experience or whether it is a consequence of the experience. Do I feel that the television is talking to me because my striatum is overactive, or is my striatum overactive because the television seems to be talking to me? I don't know whether this activity and these changes are a compensation that occur because of the experiences that, that I'm having. So these, the three C's, as David Lewis has referred to them, are very important to take into account, and they do generate an ambiguity in these measures. And beyond that, there's another problem, which is, to what extent does this really constitute an explanation for this? Um, is it rational to say that a plexus of neurons feels persecuted... Uh, could it be that dopamine entertains a belief? None of us would say that. But if I tell an individual with psychosis that I think I understand what's going on, it's because his striatum is overactive, in what way is that a useful explanation? And at this point, I think we really need to think about bridging the gap. It's a big gap because it's the gap between the mental and the physical. And we don't really have a full vocabulary for describing that. But what we do have is cognitive neuroscience, which uses terms from information processing, computational modeling, which can enable us to link the mental and the physical, and so to make these observations more tractable in terms of the brain. Now, in order to do that, I think it's important to begin by thinking about the nature of inference that's made when somebody has a delusion or when somebody has a belief more generally. Uh, we know from... Log logical theory, and I, I won't profess to be an expert, but there are many ways in which we make logical inferences. The classic and the most watertight is the deduction. If P, then Q. I see Q, therefore P. Um, but yeah, all crows are black. This is a crow, therefore it's black, that sort of thing. Alternatively, induction is really taking things a bit further, and it's bringing something of our own to the, uh, to the inference. If I see lots of black crows... I might then make the induction that all crows are black. Now, that isn't quite so logically watertight, but it's still a useful scientific method. Now, there's a further form of inference, um, which Max Coulthart talks about in recent work on delusions, and that is abduction. And that is by far the least logical, uh, the least watertight of the approaches, where essentially Q, therefore P. I see something black, it's a crow. Um, I am actually making an inference. And, and if you're interested in this, the work of Charles Sanders Peirce, of the 19th century American philosopher, uh, is very interesting because he did a lot on abductive inference, of which, is, in essence, our, our beliefs are largely made. And he said that the whole fabric of our knowledge is a matted felt of pure hypothesis. Everything we do 
during our day-to-day -day life is essentially hypothesizing about the environment. And I think this was very prescient. He said if we weren't prepared to engage in that, then we could do nothing but sit and stare vacantly at the world, which, of course, some of us can manage quite easily, as I did on the train only two hours ago. So having borne in mind that inference in delusions is largely abduction, which is in itself inherently um, an explanation for an experience that doesn't carry a great deal of logical weight, uh, we can move on to existing explanations for delusions. And these have largely boiled down into three types. The first is that a delusion is essentially a rational inference. The experience is normal, uh, sorry, the experience is abnormal, but in forming the delusion, the belief, let's say, that the television is talking to me, I am dealing with my data in a normal way. Others have argued with that and said, actually, the, delu the essence of the delusion is irrational inference, though the experience itself is normal. And then others have said you need both. So here's a, an example of the first uh, type of theory. Brendan Maher, who died in 2008, an American psychiatrist, wrote a great deal about this. And he said, um, we find there arises in the patient certain primary sensations, vital feelings, moods, awareness, as though something is going wrong. And this general delusional atmosphere, with all its vagueness of content, must be unbearable. And so the patient reaches, in the end, a resolution to that, a belief that gives them a great sense of um, relief that they finally understood all these abnormal experiences. Delusions as irrational inferences come from a whole host of theorists. I don't want to go into it, but one thing that's worth mentioning is that many of us are largely irrational. Indeed, Charles Sanders Peirce would say that we spend most of our life being irrational. And there are certain biases that we have. We tend to jump to conclusions. We come up with an inference before the data really support it. We might look only for the evidence that confirms what we believe. We might only believe things that actually make us feel better about ourselves. So there are many biases, and those are enhanced in delusions, so it's been thought. And then finally, there's a model that says it must be both. Coldheart's two-factor model says that you need to explain the content of the belief, and that is the abnormal experience, and you need to explain the reason that the belief is not rejected, even though it seems bizarre. And that is a second anomaly. And the problem is, with this, that it works very well for monothematic delusions in neurological cases where there's widespread brain damage. But to try and posit two dissociable, different abnormalities that seem to co-occur so frequently in schizophrenia and psychosis generally doesn't seem very parsimonious. And, of course, parsimony is very important in trying to theorize about these. And the other problem is... And I should say that I have, I have really quickly run through those sets of theories, and they are much more elegant than their detractors would have you believe. And in fact, Colthart's work is really superb um, in, in examining delusions and has really moved the field forward. Um, but one thing that I think gets forgotten in uh, these assessments of delusions is that actually they tend to separate the perceptual process and the inferential process. And since Helmholtz... This is Hermann Helmholtz, the German physiologist, and before him, um, people have recognized that perception itself is a process of inference. Perception is not just receiving data. Perception is actually working on data and creating something out of it. Helmholtz made this very clear, and in essence, he wrote, he wrote a wonderful treatise called the, um, the Facts of Perception in 1878, and I can't claim to have read it in the original High German, it's my German is not up to it. But the largely, the, the, the message is, or important parts of the message is, that the world consists of causes of our experience, of our sensations. But we don't have direct access to these. All we have is our rather um, insensitive and, well, not so much insensitive, but inexact sense organs. We have signs of what's going on out there, but we do not have images of what's going on out there. Sentences represent the world, they're inherently ambiguous, and so the resolution of this ambiguity is actually a hypothesis, and perception is a hypothesis. It's an abduction, in, in uh, Peirce's uh, words. The matted felt of pure hypothesis, as Peirce put it. How do we know this? Well, illusions tell us this all the time. We often superimpose on the world that which is not there. Many of you will look at this and will see a white triangle overlying 
these. You may even see the borders of the triangle, which aren't there. There is a strong feeling that there should be a triangle there because that would best explain why you have this pattern of breakages in the triangle and the circles. But there is no triangle there. So when you see the border here, your brain is creating it. It isn't there. This is your hypothesis about what best explains this. This can be very, very useful. It helps us deal with noise um, very well. I'm just going to play you a sound. I haven't had a chance to check this. I hope it works. Now, to many of you who haven't heard that before, it will sound like a rather ugly mechanical bird song. I'm now going to play that sound when it's been purified. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. Now, all I've done is change your experience, change your world view about that previous noise. I'll play the first one again, and I hope that you will be able to superimpose your prior experience on it and hear it more clearly. So many of you will have heard that much more clearly the second time, even though the sense input is just the same, essentially. You've had a prior experience that allows you to superimpose or create the meaning out of it, or at least to recognise the meaning in it with great efficiency. Another example of that, and this is one where it shows that your brain actually spends a lot of its time refusing to believe what is there, but rather telling the world what should be there. This is a very famous illusion developed by Richard Gregory, uh, an Oxford physiologist, and he um, showed this rotating hollow mask. And the mask, this is his original um, video of his original illusion. So as the mask rotates around, you can see that it's Charles Chaplin, and you can see the mask very easily. Now, it's a hollow mask, and the question that he asked is, what happens as it turns around and you see the hollow side? So at this point here, you probably don't have too much difficulty in seeing that this is a, a hollow face. Now, as it comes round, what usually happens is that you're unable to see a face as being hollow. And in fact, what your vision does is evert the face. So now you have to see a face sticking out at you. And then as it comes round again, you can see it briefly hollow there, now, what Gregory argued is actually we're so used to seeing faces sticking out at us that it's impossible to accept that a face sticks in. We superimpose this prior knowledge on the world and we refuse to accept that it can be wrong. And it's as the features become, a, become visible to you that you flip the face outwards. There are some lovely examples from the literature of how this can be manipulated. I, I don't want to spend much time on this, but... This is a study done by Sturzer and others in 2008, and they played a lovely trick on, on healthy volunteers. They showed them this, which is a, a representation of a random dot kinetogram. So all that's happening here is that the dots are moving across each other. And this gives the subject a sense that they're watching a rotating barrel, sort of series of dots moving. But because it's inherently ambiguous, sometimes it's going one way, clockwise, sometimes it's going anti-clockwise. And if you put somebody in front of it and get them, just press a button every time it seems to change direction, then they'll spend about half their time thinking it's going to the left and half their time thinking it's going to the right, and it will flip periodically. So it's inherently ambiguous. Now, what Sturzer and others did then was something very clever. They put some glasses on somebody, and they showed them a random dot kinematogram, but this time it was actually fixed so that it would always predominantly rotate from left to right. So they associated these glasses with a rotation in a particular direction. Now, this one had been fixed so that they would see it like that, irrespective of the glasses, but they didn't know that. They flipped the glasses over, and they also flipped this. So they got the sense that if the green lens was over their left eye, it would be going like this. If the red lens was over their left eye, it would be going like that. What was interesting is when they returned to the truly ambiguous kinematogram, and put the glasses on, the subjects now have an expectancy. If I'm wearing these glasses, it'll go from left to right. If I'm wearing them the other way, it should go from right to left. In reality, it was ambiguous, but this is what happened. So there was a great tendency to say to the right when they're wearing them this way, or to the left when they're wearing them this way, even though the reality was it should have been exactly the same. So there are many examples. I've just chosen one of how you can train people to see the world in a certain way. You give them hypotheses. So to summarise that first part... A delusion is a belief, and it, it's one that seems to be, to the observer, irrational. Like other beliefs, it's an example of an abductive inference, the search for an explanatory cause of a sense input that seems surprising 
or noteworthy. And previous models of delusions have treated perception and inference as separable, but I don't think, well, I'm not the only one, we don't really think that's so. So if we want a model of delusions, we must recognise this uh, bidirectional relationship between perception and inference. And that leads me to part two. Our starting point is that perception is an inference, and we're good at dealing with noisy and incomplete complete data. That's what the inference is about. We don't really know what's going on out there, so we superimpose our prior experience on it. And sometimes we experience what we accept, expect rather than what is actually there, as I hope I've shown you. Now, that such a system could become inflexible. How does it avoid that? It has to be able to update. If you just spent your entire time superimposing your own views on the world, then you would become inflexible, unable to take in new information, unable to learn. And I think one of the things that makes us able to update it is if we get a strong signal that what we're expecting really is too far away from what we're getting. There's an, a mismatch. So if I show you this, then it looks like there could be a cube behind three barriers. Do, do people see this as a sort of cube? It's not always obvious immediately. Even if I remove those barriers, it should be possible to see the cube. If, on the other hand, I introduce something to the picture that really doesn't make sense, at this point, it's like a cube behind three sort of white barriers. But if I introduce something that doesn't make sense, it becomes impossible to see that anymore, or becomes very difficult to see that as a cube. Because, of course, if there was a barrier here, it would be continuous. So having it just at the ends of each line mean, means that that hypothesis is incorrect. And as a consequence, our perception is of a series of different shaped lines, even though the actual setup of the lines here is identical to there, if you scrutinize it. And this brings in the notion of mismatch or prediction error. Prediction error could be an absolutely key signal in updating our inferences and beliefs. And this isn't a new idea. And this goes back uh, in learning theory a long way, to the early 70s at least. Um, there's a recent review by Schultz and Dickinson. Well, actually, it's not that recent anymore. I must update it, but... Uh, they, they make the point that no learning occurs, occurs when an outcome is perfectly predicted. And just as uh, Charles Sanders Peirce said, a, an abduction is a hypothesis based upon something surprising or noteworthy. And this has been uh, formalized according to various models, including this rather famous one of Raskola and Wagner, which says that the amount that you learn on a particular trial is proportional to the expression in parenthesis here is the, the mismatch between what you expected and what you got. So that what I'm saying here is that prediction error is an important signal to us that actually our current model of the world is wrong, our hypothesis is wrong. We need to update that. We need to allocate our attention. Um, it may even be a marker for distinguishing between the things we do and the things that the outside world does because the sensory consequences of what I do will be highly predictable to me. If I do something and it's unpredictable, produces an unpredictable consequence then it makes less sense to interpret it as coming from me. And I, I, I won't go into this, but this may give us an idea about the origin of delusions of control, of the belief that your own movements are being controlled. Perhaps prediction error makes them feel like they're coming from the outside. So I'd like to put forward the idea that psychosis is driven by an abnormal prediction error. But before that, what would we predict would be the experience of somebody whose prediction error signal, which has been related to the dopamine and the glutamatergic systems in the brain, what would be wrong, or what would it feel like if that was abnormal? Well, it would feel that the world had changed, actually. That the world would not seem to fit together. There would be a sense of uncertainty. Nothing would feel quite as though it fitted into place. New associations would be learned. Prediction error is a drive to learning. Things would feel novel, important, and salient. And the distinction between internally and externally generated items might be blurred. It would be quite a, a worrying world as well. Because of time, I won't go into this. So essentially, all I've been trying to draw out here is that we have this system that depends for balance on what we expect versus what we're getting. By and large, what we expect will create what we're getting. Perception is the inference. But in order to introduce flexibility, we need to be able to produce a balance. And it may be that prediction error is an important signal to create that balance. And perhaps psychosis reflects that imbalance. Is there any evidence in favor of that? Well, I've trawled the literature, actually. 
um, on early experience. Sorry, that should yeah, let's say things. Early experiences that people with psychosis have, and if you go back to the 60s, there's some beautiful papers by Chapman and McGee and others, really just sitting down with people who are experiencing the early stages of a psychotic illness and describing the sensory experiences that they have. And they say things like this, colours seem brighter, almost as if they're luminous. Everything's brighter and louder and noisier. Uh, there's no depth in the world. It's like pieces are in a, a jigsaw puzzle. It's difficult to put things together. It's as if someone had turned up the volume. Background noises seem to be just as loud and sometimes louder than the main noises. The world is, is changing for them. There's a different sensory experience of the world. Things seem salient. Norma MacDonald, who wrote a, a first-person account of, of her own schizophrenic illness, said, it was as if parts of my mind awoke. I became interested in a wide assortment of people, events, places, and ideas. The walk of a stranger in the street could be assigned to me. Every face in the windows of a passing streetcar would be engraved on my mind. People change the way they associate things. This again is from Chapman and McGee. I've got too many thoughts. You might think about that ashtray and just think, oh yes, that's for putting my cigarette in. But I would think of it and then think of a dozen different things. People associate things in different directions. Peter Chadwick, who also wrote about his own personal experiences, he's a psychologist actually, um, said, I had to make sense, any sense, out of all these uncanny coincidences, and I did it by radically changing my conception of reality. Matisek reports a patient who refers to, to the onset of their illness as the sensitivity. They became hypersensitive to the world. At ordinary times, I might have taken pleasure in watching the dog, but would never have been so captivated by it. My ability to see connections had been multiplied many times over. So there's a prima facie case for suggesting that prediction error, the sorts of things you would predict or you would expect in a persistent prediction error are comparable to the sorts of experiences that a person with a psychotic illness begins to develop. But of course, that's just a hypothesis and it needs to be tested. And so in this last part of the talk, and I hope I'm not rushing too much for you, uh, what I'd like to do is present you with some data that really try to get at that hypothesis that prediction error firing is abnormal in the context of early psychosis at least. And I'll do it with reference to two sets of studies. One is looking at people with a psychotic illness, patients who agree to be undergo brain scanning, and the other is individuals who are experiencing, healthy individuals who experience a drug that makes them temporarily uh, psychotic or semi-psychotic. So the beginning of this was really um, 2000, 2001, where we decided that we needed to find ways of looking at prediction error um, in the brain scanner, ways of engendering a prediction error signal. And I'm just going to take you through that very briefly, because that's the basis of all the studies that have gone since. So what we did was we got people to play a game. They lay in the scanner, and the game was you're going to pretend to be working for a drug company and they're testing new drugs and you need to find out whether these drugs ha cause particular syndromes. So what they would see is, as they lay in the scanner, they'd see an image that gave them information about whether a particular person had had the drug or not. It's not a very good picture, this is quite old, but uh, essentially they'd have a capsule. They would then make a prediction about whether the person would get the illness or not. At this point, they were just guessing. They'd then get some feedback. In this case, they didn't get this particular syndrome. So they begin to learn over the course of a series of trials that a particular illness or a particular drug would not cause an allergy or a, sorry, would not cause a syndrome. Um, and we would expect that prediction error would go down across these as they learnt to predict with greater and greater confidence what the outcome would be. And at some point when the learning had been established, we periodically just violated it, where they got the same drug, they predicted there would be no outcome, no syndrome, but then they received feedback to try and to tell them that actually in this case, that was wrong. So this was a prediction error, <laughs> essentially. And this was related directly to the Riscola-Wagner formulation. So what we were able to do across scans is observe how brain blood flow changed. And the prediction was quite simple, that early on there would be a strong bold response in those areas associated with prediction error. And then as time went on and as learning went on, that would go down. But then we violated the assumption it would return to a higher level. 
So it's very simple conceptually, the experiment. It was an attempt to look at brain systems associated with unexpected outcomes, with the violation of predictions. We also developed another way of testing them, which is instead of playing the drug game, they play the allergist game. Neither of these games will ever sell well on the market, I tell you. They're both rather boring. But the idea is just to get someone engaged with the task and get them learning. Here they were told, OK, you're, you're an allergist, someone who tries to understand uh, the cause of allergic reactions in people. And you have a new patient, Mr X, who suffers from allergic reactions to some meals but not others. In an attempt to discover which foods cause him to have allergic reactions, you arrange for him to eat various foods and observe whether he has an allergic reaction. So it had exactly the same setup. They might learn that he would eat ice cream and then there'd be a reaction or that he would eat cherries and there would be no reaction. Or he would have a combination of sorry, um, cherries and a cup of tea and he'd have a reaction. So the idea was they were updating their beliefs in parallel across all these different foods. And it's possible then to... I won't go into this because I don't uh, have the time. But it's possible then to change their abductions and to violate assumptions and look overall at the brain responses to prediction error. That's all this was about, was trying to get a brain marker for prediction error. And we found a lot of... This is a view of the brain from the right-hand side, front, back, cerebellum. We found a lot of frontal activity across a series of studies and also activity in the striatum, which is an um, important uh, uh, region receiving uh, transmitter or projection, dopamine projections, and the midbrain, which is the origin of those dopamine projections. So these are the sorts of areas you would expect, given all of the existing literature on humans and animals, that would be responsive to prediction error. And the question was, what happens when we take a group of um, individuals, um, 15 individuals we managed to recruit who had a psychotic illness, and we got them to do the same task? And I'm just going to summarise the results. What we found was, this, th this is the midbrain, um, this activity here, and this is the frontal cortex. Essentially, the pattern's the same in both. And what it showed was that in the controls, C, the signal when there was a prediction error was significantly greater than when there wasn't, which is precisely what we'd expect. But in our patients, this relationship seemed to be blurred, so that it was as though their brain was failing to distinguish between something that should be surprising and something that shouldn't. This was taken further in a reward learning task in the same individuals by Graham Murray. Essentially, the pattern was compatible. I, I don't have time to go into it. And what Phil Corlett showed in our individuals with psychosis is that the worse or the, the more um, inappropriate the activity in this frontal region, that's up here, the more likely they were to suffer delusion-like thinking. So not only do the patients with psychosis show an abnormality in their brain response to prediction error, but the greater that abnormality, the more likely they are to suffer from delusions. But, of course, there's a problem with patient studies, as I've said. Are these cause, consequence, or compensation? Or could they actually be due to the fact that somebody who's ill and has treatment, it would be unethical to stop their treatment for the scanning? Um, could it be that the treatment is actually causing, causing these changes? Well, we did have a subgroup of our individuals who were not receiving treatment, and we did find the same pattern. But it's still a, a problem to interpret. And so in the last part of the talk... I'm just going to talk briefly about some data that we have when we try and replicate these symptoms in people receiving the drug ketamine. So the advantage of a drug model of mental illness, and I should say a lot of people um, get quite disturbed at the idea of giving ketamine to healthy controls. In fact, um, the, the press in Cambridge, when they discovered that I was doing it, made quite a song and dance, which spread rapidly across Europe, as far as I could see, as though we were doing something... Uh, strange and pointless and unethical. I think there's a lot to be said for these drug models, as long as we're sure that the drug is safe in single doses in healthy individuals, um, because they tell us a number of things that the studying the illness can't do. They allow us to make planned, controlled manipulations of particular symptoms. They enable us to relate those symptoms to known or reasonably well-known neurochemical manipulations. 
and to relate the symptoms to particular psychological processes and the, the brain underpinnings of those, not just during drug administration, but also before, as I'll show you. Now, what we don't do with the drug model is replicate the disease entirely. We, do, we cannot give a drug to somebody and say, you're just the same as somebody who has schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression. It's simply... I mean, if we knew which drug to give, then we would know what was the cause of the illness. So a drug model can be considered something rather like a, you know, a, model of a, a scale model of a wing in a wind tunnel. All we're doing is making small manipulations, testing the effect in a particular controlled context, and then allowing that to enable us to draw conclusions about the real world. So just as a model aircraft in, the, um, in a wind tunnel, nobody would expect to be able to get on that and fly to America. Nevertheless, you can learn a lot about um, various dynamics of fast-moving air on a surface from that. So that, I think it's best to think of drug models in that way. It's not a perfect analogy, but it, it'll do. Now, the drug that we use is ketamine, and it acts on the NMDA receptor, which is uh, one of the key receptors for one of the foremost um, excitatory transmitters in the brain, glutamate. I won't go into this. I don't have time nor expertise. We know from uh, work on brain slices that um, ketamine has some interesting effects on the frequency of firing across the different layers of the cortex. So, for example, in layer three, it will slow down the firing from being um, sort of 40 to 80 hertz to being 20 to 40 hertz. And it will also bring that firing into sync, into synchrony with the lower layers. So it seems to change the overall profile of firing, moving away the, the high frequency, uh, in, in uh, layer three, or in the higher layer, and making it uh, rather lower frequency. And it also brings things into sync. I don't have time to go into this, as I'd, as I'd hoped. But essentially, on ketamine, there's a lot more synchronizing of firing at, at that range. This also is the case in humans. Uh, I won't dwell on this. But what are its effects in terms of experiences? Well, let me go straight to it. People do talk about making strange inferences, uh, somebody, this is, for example, one of our subjects who said it's like being on the film The Truman Show. I don't know if you know that. That's the film where uh, he spends all his time actually being controlled and manipulated from elsewhere, um, always being watched. And this is how our subject felt. Now, when you challenge them, this is not a fiercely held belief. They'll say, oh, yes, no, I realize it's just the drug doing it. So it, I can't say that these cause delusions, but they do cause referential ideas. But also odd perceptions um, that are rather like psychosis. I seem to lose my experience of three-dimensional space. Um, things seem to be flat. You appear like a two-dimensional image. These are our subjects. These are chosen quotes from the early studies of Chapman. Uh, the object of my gaze was very bright. I felt that my hearing had changed. I couldn't make out the outline of things. Again, these seem to be comparable to what the people are describing at the very early stages of psychosis. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rush through a bit. What does ketamine actually do to brain activity when people do the same task, the one with the foods analogies, manipulating prediction error? Um, well, interestingly, it seems to have the same effect on frontal cortex. So when subjects are on placebo, when there's a prediction error, sorry, this should say prediction error rather than violation, there's the expected elevation of activity in this region... And for the control stimuli, where it's no prediction error, then that is obliterated. But on ketamine, that effect is lost, just as we saw with people with psychosis. Indeed, what we did in this study was we gave low doses of ketamine in the scanner, or placebo, because we don't want ketamine at a high dose can make you feel nauseated and you don't want people to vomit in the scanner. But after they'd come out of the scanner, we, we increased the dose to produce some of the psychopathology. So when this, when this measure was made, actually people were feeling remarkably well. They weren't feeling terribly sort of frightened or insecure or uh, the, the symptoms were not strong. But we brought them out of the scan and we, and we increased the dose. And what we found there was that actually the degree to which the person was sensitive to, in this region, to prediction error on placebo was predictive of how they would later respond to the ketamine a month later. 
In terms of um, perceptual changes, I won't go into the scale. This basically measures the extent to which their perceptions are becoming disrupted, and also in terms of their beliefs. So there's something very odd that struck us, that actually the likelihood that you're sensitive to prediction error under normal circumstances seems to tell us how vulnerable you are when you receive this drug at a later stage. And that was fascinating to us, and it led to a further study, which we haven't written up yet, but I'm just going to very briefly present in my last couple of minutes. And what we wanted to do here was ask, is it possible to predict what's going to happen to somebody on ketamine if we scan them on day one and then bring them back 28 days later and they engage in a, just some ketamine testing? So the idea here is just to, to make it clear. They came along, they got into the MRI scanner, and they did some tasks involving prediction error. And what we were interested in was not the overall group level of activity, but actually the individual variability in that group. Because we were going to bring them back later, at least 28 days later. Uh, this is the ketamine infusion pump. And we were going to get them to do a series of tasks. And the key question here is, is there anything about the brain activity here that tells us what they're going to experience at a later date when they receive this ketamine challenge. And the first thing was we replicated this correlation between frontal activity to prediction error measured here. So the people who showed the highest level of activity also showed the highest level of ketamine-related disturbance in terms of their dissociative symptoms. So this was the previous data, and this was the rather more reliable, I think, replicated data. We also got them to do a perceptual task when they were on ketamine. The essence of this is that all of this surrounding um, contrast has an effect on what you see here. So the task is to decide which one of these four this particular central bit matches best. Now, most people tend to say 20 or 30%. But the reality is it actually matches this one best. And the reason that we tend to get it wrong is because this is all very high contrast, and therefore that has a suppressive effect on the central one. Now, the vulnerability to that was also predicted by frontal activity. So the extent to which you um, were more likely to, to show this illusion was actually related to low levels of frontal activity. Sorry, high levels of frontal activity. I'm getting this wrong. Sorry. Resistance to the illusion, which is what we see in schizophrenia, was related to higher levels of frontal activity. The long and the short of it is that we were able to predict the effect. Now, I'm, because of time, I'm going to have to leave out this bit. So I've been very demanding of your time so far. I'm just going to briefly wrap up and allow you to relax. So to summarize what I've been trying to say, we don't need to invoke distinct perceptual or inferential problems to try to explain delusions, even though the existing models have suggested that we do. I think it's possible to have a, a more unified model to explain them. And that unified model is based on the idea that the brain makes predictions which may overwrite incoming data. In other words, the world is what the brain says it is rather than what the incoming sense say it is. Now, if those predictions are violated to a sufficient degree via prediction error, then the brain has no choice but to engage in new inference, new experience of the world, and new learning. I would like to suggest that perturbed prediction error signal can account for many of the early symptoms of emerging psychosis. Uh, the brain imaging studies of mental illness are in keeping with that suggestion. Um, a drug that produces these symptoms, ketamine, is also in keeping with that. And also, it seems, this emerging finding, which I really don't know what to make of it, but I'm very interested in pursuing it, variations in brain sensitivity to prediction error are predictive of the cognitive, perceptual, and inferential effects of the subsequent drug challenge. So all of us have variable ways of dealing with the world, and it may be that an enhanced sensitivity, an enhanced ability to change our inferences, might actually be associated with an enhanced vulnerability if we take ketamine which, of course, I wouldn't recommend anyone doing except uh, under controlled conditions. So strictly speaking, we're all deluded. We're all making up the world as we go along. And in looking into the history of, um, of the Collège de France, I was really pleased to see that actually a major figure in it has been uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Sorry, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. 
And I'm told, and I haven't seen it yet, but I'm so looking forward to see it, that one of his quotations hangs above the college hall, which is uh, something along the lines of not preconceived, uh, uh, not preconceived notions, but the idea of free thought. And I think that actually captures rather beautifully what I'm suggesting is the problem with delusions. There's far too many preconceived notions and that free thought is not allowed to update those. Um, so on that note, um, I would like to acknowledge a huge number of collaborators whom I won't name because of time, but particularly Phil Corlett and uh, Sonna DeWitt and uh, Graham Murray. And actually, Matthias Pasiglioni, who's, who's worked here, did a lot of work on our, on our um, prediction error um, imaging data in patients, so thanks to him as well. And thank you very much for your patience. I do appreciate it. Uh, <laughs>